Don't yeah, Ben, ben, it, Stone, ben Stone is Law and Order, uh, and Rudy Baylor is um, the Rainmaker. So two of those are fictional. <laughs> well, so we have a good chance with one of them. Um, real ba okay. So, and by the way, Real Bambuga, thank you very much, and good to see you again. Okay, here's what's happening now. Leonard French is trying. I just got a notification for our own live stream. Leonard French, your favorite copyright lawyer, although I take exception to that. Maybe your favorite American copyright lawyer, but I'm not really a copyright lawyer. Leonard French, you all know him, favorite copyright lawyer. He's trying to get this going live on, on, you're trying to stream this as well, and I think you are. Amazing. So we are now live. No, they'll come, they'll come in. Build it and they shall come, which is the next movie we're watching tomorrow. Good, because, and also you're shooting your, you're streaming your video on your channel with a good DSLR camera and not uh, the, the Okay. Oh, oh, someone, someone made a joke about a sex bot. They're in the sex bot. Viva Pride keep on inviting me to really sexy, sexy live streams. I'll take it. Um, so Leonard French, you all know Leonard French, and if you don't, now you know him. Leonard French does copyright law, does... You do a lot of content, actually, and I don't know how you do it. And Uncivil, we're going to get to you in a second because you do a lot of content as well, but I know how you do it, so. Can't hear you. Okay. I can be heard now. <laughs> he's, he's, back with, he's back with the bribe, man. Okay, Real Bamboonga, thank you again, like, tremendously. Oh, and obligatory bribe. Watch Wild cut. Wild Country. We're watching Wild Wild Country. Rajneeshi cult red people took over town of Oregon, tried to snag a vote by importing homeless people, blah. You've heard it all before. Netflix series has great legal issues and cranky old people, yay. We're going to have nothing but time over the next few weeks, but this, we're not talking about that tonight. Only terrible We're talking about my cut of this is what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> yeah, geez, those are some nice what? super chats. I don't remember the last time I saw a $100 super chat on mine. Real, Good for you. Real Bambooga is, I mean, it's, uh, first of all, I thank you, but I almost feel guilty. But thank, I'm thanking you more than anything else. Um, Uncivil Law, you know who you are. We know who you are, but who are you? Oh, geez, such deep questions. <laughs> but I am a patent attorney, so I deal with intellectual property on the invention side, and I cover all kinds of legal issues. In fact, I did a, an hour and a half live stream on this exact case earlier today, so I'm happy to talk about it again. <laughs> okay, now, actually, <clears throat> while people are streaming in or coming in, and by the way, everybody who's watching... Tweet the link out because YouTube is sometimes slow on notification. And low tech, smash like, you're right. How do you guys go about creating your content? Because you do put out a lot of content. And I don't know, um, what's your method? Like, uh, start with you, Kurt. How do you do it? Well, what I do is I have a running just do a Word document file in Google Docs. And every time I see an interesting legal story or legal opinion, I put it just on, a, on an ongoing list. I think right now I've got like 78 on the list. And then every Sunday I do a batch shoot. So depending on how many I need and my energy level, I pick somewhere between like seven to nine stories. And I spend the morning on Sunday morning while Leonard is doing his stream. I spend the morning doing the case briefing for all those stories. And then I just batch shoot them for about four hours. And then I cut them up and release them one at a time. And because I do usually seven to nine every time and I usually release six days a week, I have like three weeks worth in reserve at any time. So for things like moving or whatever, I've got them in reserve to keep posting. So it's nice. And uh, cool. Kurt, Kurt's method is similar to my method. Um, I We do a Sunday show. This is the lawful masses part of lawful masses. So it's not just lawful masses of people, but also lawful like preachings about law. Um, so Sunday mornings, we I pick you know three or four, sometimes five stories, and we take about two, two and a half hours to sort of do like a live production. Shoot. I'm looking at the wrong camera, um, to do like a live yeah. production shoot, and um, then I have actually hired one of uh, one of our our channel uh, our moderators uh, who who is now sort of our brand manager, um, uh, Brandon. And he does a preliminary edit where he gets everything exactly the way I want it. And then I will go through and do any final tweaks and checking for flow and everything. And he's getting very good at it. Uh, so I wake up in the morning. He's got an edit done. I uh, review the final edit. We, I make the thumbnail. I'm getting better at that over time. And um, we just try to release a video a day. Uh, I 
our next evolution is going to be trying to write more so that the introduction kind of pops and flows a little bit more, gets people interested in, you know, why are we talking at you for the next 20 to 40 minutes and, and maybe, uh, maybe help people stick around a little longer. It's very interesting. And now, so, but if something comes up the day of and you actually just have to churn something out the day of, you will, you'll get that video out the day of if, if needed. Yeah, usually through a live stream. I, I really like, um, so I, I, when I was a kid, I was a stage performer. I was, I was in a group that did uh, professional um, stage uh, productions. Stage production. uh, so it was, I was like a singer, dancer kind of thing. Um, and so that, you know, that I more or less grew out of that, uh, you know, realized that I wasn't, you know, going to be the world's next uh, uh, rock star, but um, the kind of need or, or love of live performance is still with me. So I have, it is kind of naturally drawn to doing live streams and things. That's very cool. Okay, now Nate is in the house, but I'm going to pull up the super chat before. Viva versus Uncivil versus Fat versus French Smash Brothers. <laughs> Did you just call me Fat? No, I said no, no, French. <laughs> it's French and Smash. <laughs> um, Oh, th uh, first of all, thank you very much, Jim Keel. And I don't know what Smash Brothers. What is Nintendo it? Switch, man? Nintendo Switch. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a battle royale game. You like you know how oh, the, Mortal Kombat or something like oh, that. But how about Mortal no, Kombat without the blood oh, guts and gore? By you know, the way, suitable how, for how Nintendo. do you not know Toto's Africa, Viva? How do you not know Toto's Africa? I tell you, the only um, uh, yesterday. I know that oh. only because of um, the uh, the band there. That's a Canadian band, Weezer, that did the remake last oh, year. Right, right. That was the only reason I knew it. Um, and now it's the Brody Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's going on, everybody. The Brody Bunch. Hey, got, Nate. How's Leonard it going? French, Kurt, right there, Miller. and Nate Brody. Introduce yourself. Everybody knows you, but introduce yourself. I'm Nate Brody. I'm I'm the fearsome foursome of this of this group. This is the Fantastic <laughs> Four. So um yeah, I'm Nate Brody. I'm an attorney here in New York. I was um I taught at law school for a couple of years, and now I, I do. Civil practice and um, and really in, in a lot of criminal law stuff. I'm still getting a lot of criminal law stuff, but um, but now this Corona stuff is like put all my cases on like hiatus for like the next oh wow two so, months. Like hey, they've 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 shut down everything, but it's great because like I, I have like the bank threatening me on one case. Like we're gonna send the house the auction. I'm like they just <laughs> not right now. For, like Lock the next that. five months. Yeah, what are you talking about? It's like you know, and so that's so now they like have no no leverage. So it's crazy. So now, just so, just so we're clear now, Nate Brody. It, Nate, if I may, you're in New York City? Yes, I am in New York in, City right now. In the heart of it. Kurt, yes. you're, you're in Texas? Austin, Texas. And Leonard, you're where? Uh, I'm Midwest? in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh, I know. we're living here in Allentown. <laughs> nope, yeah. I don't know. That <laughs> oh, that's Billy Joel. I've not heard that. <laughs> that is Billy Joel. Ah. The man himself. Billy. No, it's amazing. So, like, we're in different necks of the woods here, and all experiencing this phenomenon to a greater or lesser degree. But I'll I'll go out on a limb and say that Nate is in the epicenter of the mayhem. Yeah, it's it, it's it's gotten it, it's it's gotten a little worse here. Like my um, t today, my my we, that's one of the things that was happening today. One of the my wife's patients um, just came down with was um, oh. coronavirus. Wow! And um, it was it was it was it was scary because. It, it's funny because the hospital they they have like this huge plan about corona 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 what they're going to do but the one thing they didn't have a plan for is that a pregnant woman who gives birth what do you do with the baby you know how do you isolate the baby mm. so everybody's thinking about the mother having the virus but nobody thought about what do we do because she's just had a baby you know how do you isolate the baby with so now they kind of had to come up with all that stuff kind of on the whim. so that's what she's been doing for like the past so it's just been it's like literally insane because every little thing you know you just don't sometimes you just don't think about so yeah, and now I'm not pulling this one up not to pick on Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I did just pick on him on Twitter. While these spoiled brat celebrities on drugs and think they're above the law and everything else, um, this particularly is how they... Okay, sorry, this was not going to be the theme tonight, but I, I I tend to get frustrated with that sentiment as well because I do feel the same way like Schwarzenegger and his jacuzzi smoking a cigar talking about how quarantine's not that bad. Try being stuck with three freaking kids who are homeschooling now. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's, many it's, things have come Leonard to and a I don't have point. kids. So, you know. Now I don't have kids and I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Reddit and I'm reading Child Free and everyone's like, thank goodness I don't have kids right now. <laughs> That's why you guys are on the right side of the screen. You guys <laughs> on the left side. This is the, the, the child suffering right here. <laughs> it's just like, 
you know, when you have to fight with a kid to wash their hands, when you know you go for the walk to get some fresh air, you know the struggle is not rational to wash your hands. But when you're a three year old kid, you're not rational. Yeah. And then, and then we, you know, Leonard, you got dogs, so we know that you know at least you get out to to walk the dogs. But it's no, it's it's um, it's the, crazy. The, oh, the dogs, the, in the house. dogs belong to my parents now. Ah, okay. Well, no, I, my parents really... are elderly, and I gave my dogs to my parents while I was in Luxembourg for two and a half months. And the dogs are so used to being with my parents, and it's so good for my parents to yeah. to have that 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 companionship. That I've just decided that the dogs belong at my parents' house now, and I'll go over and visit them. And hey, I get to go visit my parents too. That is a, that is a win win. Yeah. And then uh, they get to well, feed me, so that it's a win win win. <laughs> Sorry, go. So on civil, what were you saying? I just say maybe not with visiting the parents so much right now. <laughs> but yes, I'm very careful. Yeah. Um, so let's see here now. Uh, I mean, Booker says, Viva, but you have an awesome assistant for all that. I don't have an. I am the assistant. I've got an off an awesome boss, Marion, who's who's <laughs> making sure that things don't fall apart because we're everyone's just trying to survive. It's 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 phenomenal. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me see this. I'm going to get this out. Sorry, it sounds like Katy Perry should isolate herself from everyone. Okay, so the subject we were not going to talk about the that the Voldemort. We don't. That's not the purpose for tonight. Katy Perry. Okay, the lawsuit, which you know, it's not. It, it well, I call it the Voldemort virus, but I still got you know. Yeah, I still, yeah, I still yeah. yeah. You mad. can't say it on YouTube here either. <laughs> oh yeah. And I don't care about that. We we are not here to talk about that. This is to somewhat distract about the less um, pressing things in life. Yes. Uh, copyright infringement or yes. plagiarism, whatever. Let's, we're gonna we're gonna get. It. <laughs> so let me just do one thing. I'm gonna see what happens when I bring this up. Yes, that, that's awesome. I've so, only made it to awesome. page 22, though. Doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's single spaced. Why would you release a single spaced yeah. opinion? Oh, and, well, there, and there, there's a good. I mean, there's a good 15 pages which are not. You know, there's there's four pages of summary of fact, which if you've read the first, you know, if you if you saw the trial, you didn't need to read, but it, it's long. And I read it in the car today, but Leonard has been highlighting it as we as we talk. So, um, and I'm gonna have to go ahead and bring up Lemon GF right now, who says, "Hit like." Support your local foursome with a th with a thumb. <laughs> okay, you know what? Let me just go ahead. While we do that, I'm gonna just take a picture there and yeah. boom. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, you know, like your spouse says to you once in a while, I shaved for you. <laughs> I, so did anyone notice I did, I did trim because I was um, I have some bad habits and I, I got some bald spots here, so now I have to bring oh, it all back. So it grows yeah, back. You're only one quarter of the screen now, so you look fine. Okay, good. <laughs> so, we're going. Just as uh, okay, I don't. I didn't bring that up on purpose, but my uh, um, okay. And real bamboo says, "Call, call it the Lake Elsinore virus or the Shino virus, or if you're feeling especially sassy, the Norco virus." I'm gonna have to look up what all those things are because I don't know <laughs> actually. But they sound even worse than the original. Uh, and we're not getting into the debate that's on social media today as to what you call it. But who cares? Okay, we're side note. Katy Perry versus. Uh, Flame, the Christian rapper. Why does anyone know why he gets called the Christian rapper so oh, often? Joyful Noise is a Christian song. Hmm. Okay, I did not know that. I mean, literally the opening. Let me let me pull up the opening lyrics here because we can't play it, right? Uh, <laughs> lyrics, <laughs> Joyful Noise. I mean, literally, your boy's been a quick a Christian quite a few years. Victory in faith, but I failed in my fears. I heard a lot of words that have tickled many ears. That's why I praise God for the word that we adhere. I just lit it French on the ones and twos right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, in, and in my head, all I heard was. <laughs> 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 okay, so, it, but it's not. Is it a Christian? Is it an old Christian song, or was that? No, it's new. It's uh, two thousand something. So, Fl Flame is known as being a, a a rapper for the the religion of the Christian. Yeah, sure. For God, I, mean, I don't. I, I I'm no. I'm no musicologist. I am no Lord musicologist. But right. that song <laughs> is obviously a Christian song. I'm not <laughs> saying one one way or the other anything about it, good or bad. It's just that's the song is definitely Christian. He literally says it. Okay. Has has anyone ever heard of? And I'm not saying this to be mean. And there's no but. I had never heard of Flame before this lawsuit. Uh, oh. I had not heard of Flame. I think I had heard the song. It, it sounded familiar when I heard it last year, 
so I think I had heard it, but I, I haven't been a participant in the Christian faith since about 2003. So uh, before that, I would have totally probably heard it, but uh, I don't think it was out then. Like I'm, I'm just texting my wife to say that our kid can come downstairs because I hear him screaming bloody murder upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now so you've you've all we've all read the decision um, in so many words. Who who? who? I've read twenty two pages of the thirty two page oh, decision. I have not read a thing. <laughs> I tried to watch Uncivil Law, but then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go in it cold because you guys have done enough reading where I'm not going to read. I got I'm read. I'm too too much right now. I'm reading coloring books and ABCs all day. So I'm like, I'm going to leave the reading to you guys tonight. Uh, it, Kurt, do you want to summarize it or should I summarize it? Go for it, Viva. <sighs> okay. My <laughs> understanding is that the there was an original trial by jury demanded by Flame, the Christian rapper, suing Katy Perry over, uh, what are we calling it? Copyright infringement of the yep. ostinato of his song. Which one is that? Is that Katy Perry or is that Flame? <laughs> That's technically um, both of them. Uh, the, this, the, 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 they have. There's actually two different ostinatos, which is another part that that that, that seems to get overlooked. Um, I think in Flame's Joyful Noise, it does it. It does two different ostinatos. It does this, and then. That's the and the one second I'm... part is the mm -hmm. one that's in Katy Perry's. Okay, yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. and that sounds that sounds right. Um, okay, so let's see, newbie. But I'm gonna try not to interrupt too much with the super chats, but we've got to bring him. Newbie says, "Seems like I finished my wife's car just in time." <laughs> We're talking Katy Perry. <laughs> so, uh, so um, uh, Flame sues copyright infringement over the ostinato, which is a section of her song and a section of his. They're different. Call them hooks or different underlying sections of the song. The chorus of Katy Perry's is different than the chorus of, of Flames. Oh yeah, the whole rest of the song is completely different. It's like was, just was, that one part. Yeah, and, and now the question, so then the, the, there was a question as to whether or not that is sufficient to be copyright protected or- Original, be, original, it, original enough to be copyright protected. Yeah, copyright or, protects original works of authorship. I, oh yeah, so original enough, or is it a building block of music that is not susceptible of copyright in whole or in part? And that's what we're going to get into in the judgment. Right. Um, trial by jury. This is one thing I don't understand. We'll get to it. Someone's going to answer it because I don't know. It go, it, Trial by jury. It goes to a trial by jury while seemingly there is this motion to dismiss on a question of law that is pending. Jury hears all evidence, renders a judgment for $2.8 million for flame on the basis that it's it infringed on his original work. Uh, and there was an issue about access to the work because his song was on the internet for a long time. Um, and, and and she writes with musicologists. She doesn't just like sit in an isolated room like, like we all have to now and write her music without any um, outside influence. She has musicologists. She has, has writers that help her write. They, they might even write something and then show it to her. I don't even know how it works. I'm assuming everybody's got their own creative process. But they had musicologists that uh, testified and, and they they assumed that they would have had access to let me turn off my, my sound here. That they would have, that they assumed they would have had access at least to hear it, you know, at some point. Yeah, because I think I think one of the arguments in the in the second decision, the one we're going to look at tonight, was like it had been it had been viewed two point six million times on YouTube, and so there was sort of a presumed or deemed access or to the to the music. Um, so the the jury awards in favor of Flame two point eight million dollars. They file uh what what's the word in in an American law? Not a re amended, but a re renewed. Uh, this one's a renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law. Okay. So they make a motion, a renewed motion. Renewed means, does renewed mean amended or does it mean just brought again because it was suspended for whatever the reason? There's there's a rule, federal rule of civil procedure 50, and I, know I sound smarter than I actually am. I'm reading this directly from the court's opinion. Um, 50A is for before the jury verdict and 50B is for after the jury verdict and the renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law is 50B after the jury verdict. So this is okay. after the jury verdict, which is why it's called renewed motion. So after a jury verdict and after a jury trial that lasted however long, jury contemplates all of the evidence, renders its decision in favor of plaintiff. They make a renewed, was it renewed? It was a, it was a near 14 day jury trial. It was from July 17th to August 1st. 
that's pretty long for a jury trial, boy. Yeah, wow. That's pretty long Damn, for a jury 14 trial. Days. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it wasn't the whole 14 days because of weekends and things, but whatever that period of time was, it was five, 10 days in there at least. That's kind of crazy nonetheless. So 14 days, let's just say 10 days, two weeks yeah. on, a, on a copyright claim. They have uh, experts. We're going to get into the experts testifying as to why this ostinato, is, which consists of anywhere between five and nine separate blocks, independent blocks that create the ostinato, the rhythm. Do we, Are we getting ahead of the judgment? No, that sounds, I mean, that's No, fair. You're, you're fine. Okay. Um, so, it was yeah. about eight notes in a what's called a descending minor ostinato. So we're in the key uh, right here. I'm in the key of A minor. So we're just going to descend. So eight notes. That's it. That's all. That's well, really all that we're talking about is those eight notes. Isn't that like a musical scale though? If you're just descending order and you are, and you are getting straight to what the chord is going to say. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, isn't that just a very simple thing that anybody in music can do? And we all, you know, we all make cars with tires and steering wheels. So how can you have a, you know, infringement claim when everybody's got to have tires and a steering wheel? Same thing with music. You've only got so many notes. There are only twelve notes in the chromatic scale. I'm thinking the wrong camera again. Like, there's only twelve <laughs> notes in the chromatic scale, and and you know those. Even though you have octaves, then and you can have you know five five or more octaves in an instrument's range. Um, you know, there's only so many building blocks you can build a song with. So at some point we don't protect when people are just using the basic building blocks like Legos to build a song. Um, we protect the finished creation or we protect a particularly long arrangement of notes or something. And uh, there's a case in here that the court cites to that says that seven notes is enough to gain copyright protection. And then the court deals with that, in, you know, in other ways in, in the Katy Perry case. So, and th this this was the crux of what everyone got. When I first did the video, which was ra not rationalizing, but just explaining the original decision, people were getting angry. They said, had you not seen Andrew Neely's video? Uh, Adam Neely. Adam Neely's video. They said, had you not seen Adam Neely's video? He did a great breakdown of why it's not original. It's been like, you know, in old songs from hundreds of years ago. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's nothing- I disagree with Adam Neely too. It was fine. <laughs> <Did it again? laughs> I disagreed with Adam Neely too. So, so, so that's the thing. Like they said, is it not just a descending chromatic scale? And then my argument was, well, is Mary had a little lamb not just an ascending scale than a descending scale? Like that, that, ba, 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 ba. It's, it's, it's a very simple, yeah, rudimentary, you know, up and down a scale. And th so, in this case, the argument was, and this is what the judge reassessed, was that the ostinato. Although just a descending chromatic, descending minor chromatic scale, ba, 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 although it had different elements to it, it had rhythm, it had sync. I don't know if syncopation was one of the words, but it had basically sure. rhythm. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, timbre, tonality. timbre, tonality. It had a it had a synthesizer sound to it. Oh yeah, that's right, the synthesizer sound. So it had a number of elements that made it distinct and therefore copyrightable. That was what the original, I guess, the original tr jury decided that. You know, it is a, but it was distinct enough and unique enough, even if it's eight notes, that it could be protected. And this judge comes, this judge, who is the same judge as the trial judge, right? Yes. Yes. This, so this is the same court we did. This is not an appeal. This is the same court and and Katy Perry's team and believe it or not, Flames team also asked for a renewed judgment. Um, overriding the jury's verdict or whatever. I, Flames team wanted prejudgment interest. We're not really going to to talk about that too much in this opinion. Um, but Katy Perry's team wanted to invalidate the jury's verdict because as a when when we when we talk about juries and the law, the jury is the fact finder. The jury does not have to interpret the law. The judge and the lawyers work out questions called jury instructions that go to the jury and the jury then decides on those instructions what their finding is. In this case, the judge is going to decide that or judge has decided that the matter should have been decided under the law part okay. before so and we didn't even need a jury. Okay, so now I'm going to get there in one second, right after I read Life Sandiger's uh, super chat. I like the tenacity of the real Bambunga. He's tenacious. We are all going to watch that yeah. video, the movie. We're all going to watch it, all of us. <laughs> Pinky promise. You know, it's it's interesting because with that, we usually say the the jury is the judge of the facts, and the judge is the judge of the law. That's essentially what you're saying, right, Lynn? Yeah. But so now here's a question: 
How many of you have ever been involved in a... I mean, I, I've never done trial by jury because we don't have it for civil matters in, in Quebec or oh. Canada. Why would they have... Ha why would the judge have allowed it to go to a two-week trial on, by jury if only to adjudicate on this motion after the fact? Why not adjudicate on this very motion? Okay, hold on. I think I might be answering my own question. But why adjudicate on this motion after the trial has occurred? Well, the... So some of this is, is is one of the things I wanted to bring up with the um, the Adam Neely thing that we were talking about. A lot of people assume that uh, lawyers have lawyers or judges have are like they're like oracles. They know everything and they have <laughs> and they have prescience. They can they can foresee everything before it happens. Uh, instead, what we have here is kind of the intersection of of, of tests. So we, you know, we lawyers here know that we've got a million different legal tests for everything. Mm -hmm. Here we have something called the ens the extrinsic test, which is a matter of law test. It's an objective test, and then we have the intrinsic test, which is the fact test for the jury. So we got through the extrinsic test because the judge did think that there was something for the jury to rule on, and so we got to a jury that way. And then after the fact, the parties made sort of a better showing of why the, or rather the uh, Katy Perry, the, the defendant, made a, a better showing as to why it should have been what ended at the uh, ex extrinsic test, the, the law test. Okay, so, and then that's an interesting thing. So in this motion, and first of all, Manuel MV, thank you very much, one euro. I hope everything's good in Europe, depending on where you are, but. Oh yeah. Um, in the, so in this case, because in the judgment, they're referring to evidence that was adduced via experts. So that presumably, only occurs after the trial. It's not like this was not. No, oh, that's during the trial. Oh, say that again. I mean, that would be during the trial. Well, the, the witnesses that were called were expert witnesses. Yeah, right? for sure. And, and this judgment refers to expert witness, so it means that it's after evidence has been adduced. So right. it's not like it's not like a motion to dismiss before any deposit. Oh, depositions before any um, examination before any evidence is adduced on the face of the file. So the 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 Leonard, what was it? There were there was two motions. The pre and the and the post. But yeah, I don't the, the motion for judgment as a matter of law and then the renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law. Okay, so now the motion for a mat as a matter of law, uh, you guys can tell me from, from a state's perspective, is that before any evidence is adduced and sort of like a motion to dismiss type thing or is that does it mean evidence has been adduced? The, the record is fully fleshed out and uh, be before the the jury you know there's 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 all the evidence that's in the record but then the the jury still has to hear testimony and things um and then make a fact finding decision if i understand it correctly i have i haven't actually myself gone through this level of litigation and had to present anything to a jury trial and then entertain filing a renewed Actually, that's not true. I did have a family law case once, but that doesn't count because that's not nearly this uh, <laughs> this complicated. And well, yeah, I, I know. Oh, I'd say I, I know in criminal law, you sometimes will have this where you'll have first. First, you have your your motions at the beginning to exclude and exclude evidence based on law, and then you'll have your trial. But then the defendant, after the prosecution has has made its case, will then ask for the case to be dismissed because the prosecutor didn't prove their case. And then after that, after the defense then puts on the case, if they're convicted again, then you'll have another motion brought up by the defendant saying as a matter of law, either the the, the jury's verdict was, was antithetical to law. You know, maybe it didn't make any sense. Maybe there might've been some type of contradiction in law or something like that. So, so there are these like procedural processes in place. I know in criminal law that when you can, when you can have something like this happen after a jury verdict, when, you know, they, they can say the jury's verdict um, in this particular, instance is contradictory to law you know it just doesn't make any sense but that's the interesting thing because like from, from my perspective no knowledge of how this works you have the jury verdict the lay person's understanding or even the lay lawyer canadian lawyer's understanding is you have the jury after that you have your judgment that's it the only next step is costs or appeal so like because hypothetically they make a uh a refiled motion i'm gonna screw up on the word again um mm. What was the, the word we're looking for? The renewed, renewed. judgment. Renewed renewed judgment? Re a renewed judgment. So if the judge then says, no, we stick by the jury, then they get a second kick at the can at an appeal. Well, so, there was also an intervening yeah, event. Here there's a basis for case. it, but yeah. Yeah. The, the, there was an intervening event in this specific case. There was a case called from Led Zeppelin dealing with uh, Stairway to Heaven, which was decided by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on March the 6th, which is referenced in this decision. 
So the, is it, is it or is it is it, it the underlying the not appeals court decision that was referenced? I think it was I, the I assumed I assumed it was the uh, on bonk, but I could be wrong. Maybe you're right. Okay, I I will take a look. The, the sites are in here and it and it's it's not like a you're right because I'm wrong kind Led, of thing. Because it was Led Zeppelin slip and I'm hey. like, "Oh, if it's Led Zeppelin slip, slip opinion, that means oh, it just issued." Yeah, it just so issued. I assumed, I assumed slip, it was yeah. the on bonk that they were referring to. Oh, so I so so since these just just waited for the appeal to come through. Since yeah, which makes total sense and, because yeah. you're issue, you're making a decision as a matter of law, hmm. and you're in the Ninth Circuit because this is a California court, and the Ninth mm -hmm. Circuit governs California, so you know this case is up there. So wait for it to be decided, and then just throw it right into your opinion. Be like, well, the law changed in the last literal ten days, so now let me factor that into the analysis. So um, <laughs> I may have missed the part about the judgment. What did that led the led uh, stairway to heaven judgment? What, what was what was the principle that it is, that issued from that judgment? So long story short, there was a long there was a lawsuit over stairway to heaven whether star, stairway <laughs> to heaven was infringing. The jury in that case found no, and the appeal was based at least in part on the jury instructions. And the oh. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, in its slip that just issued said um, that essentially, because it was three notes, I think, that were at issue, something like that, but that the three notes were not sufficiently original to be warranted copyright protection in the mm. underlying song that uh, Stairway to Heaven was purportedly trying to infringe. So there was not enough creativity in the other song. And so the rationale here is that there was not enough creativity in this work, in the descending Asanago, or whatever it's called, to uh, reach an infringement. That and was a, the rationale of the decision, as far as I read it. And a quick point about Led Zeppelin that really needs to be driven home. And I think we're actually we were going to release the Led Zeppelin video tomorrow. Um, but a quick point about that is that the Led Zeppelin, the, the Taurus, Spirits Taurus, fell under the 1909 Copyright mm. Act, not the 1976 Copyright Act. And there's mm. a big distinction between the two. The 1909 Copyright Act did not protect the sound recording. It only protected the sheet music. And the only sheet music was literally eight measures of Taurus. So all of the, the whole Led Zeppelin thing, I feel, I feel almost doesn't apply the same way because we were only talking about sheet music. We were not talking about how that sheet music was interpreted through a, a performance recorded, you know, as a sound recording. Hmm. That's very interesting. So, so the Led Zeppelin judgment comes in in the interim which then allows them to issue, which then allows them to sort of add an argument to their refiled motion. Yeah. What was the last, uh, Nate, we just did something on this, wasn't there? There was another case where a judgment came out in the interim that they cited. That was Sandman, right? No, it wasn't Sandman. Oh, son of a beasting. I'll get it in a second. But there was there was one where there was another judgment that came out in the interim that they cited to dismiss. Oh, it was, um, it was Keemstar or it was the one before that. Um, I'll get it in a second. Um, okay, so that's interesting. So, so that's interesting also. Go get the apple. Go get the apple. Tomorrow. So the <laughs> new judgment was was the interesting was the intervening factor, which is very interesting. Um, now we got we've got Saborium says, does this mean that Journey can sue every artist who used their four chord pop song a la da da? Believe? Well, not anymore. No, but, really, um, the opposite. Mm -hmm. it, it means that that to a to a level like you can't use you, you can use the same elements. Um, you just have to you know not be doing direct copying, but it can't be substantially similar. And you know there's a lot of detail in here about what is substantial similarity. Oh, and mm -hmm. the case was actually uh, Sargon of Akkad, uh, Akila Akila Hughes versus Sargon of Akkad. Yeah, and there was a there was a copyright claim that a copyright lawsuit that was rendered in the interim that they used to, to support their claim. Uh, the, the judge used to support the decision. Hold on, I just saw some two things come up here. We've got Caleb Crow says, "Love today's cast. Hope you guys keep doing this. I'm I, I'm game anytime we can all get this together, and maybe over the next six weeks. Or... I'm, I'm here. I'm not <laughs> yeah, going we're, anywhere. We're we're going. Going. We'll just <laughs> shut in right now. Seventh, this is where I am room. for the next three months. We all know that nobody's going anywhere. In place. So if it doesn't happen again, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, yeah, we we can do it again." And we got malted in Montreal. Who I what know are you guys doing tomorrow morning? <laughs> uh, in a lawyer who specializes in bird law, cheers, fellow colleagues. Malted in Montreal, <laughs> nice to see you again. Okay, so let's 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 start flipping through the decision because it is 
it is interesting. Okay, I'm gonna bring up the decision. You're gonna see all of our faces turn very small. I'm gonna mute my mic um, when for the noise on the side here. Um, okay, so new, the new decision comes out. They make their, they refile their motion under whatever, refiled under 50B. I'm trying to remember all this because I'm gonna do a shorter video for tomorrow if I can get. Yeah, that's. I, I'm probably gonna have to do a shorter video here uh, tomorrow as well. But I might, um, have, I might have to play drive there's some, some There's some dates here. So they filed the motion for judgment as a matter of law, October 9th, 2019. So way before anything recent had happened, defendants replied December 27th, uh, or rather uh, uh, plaintiffs replied in November, November 20th, then December 27th was the, was the reply because you get like those the, the reply. Mm -hmm. um, and then the renewed motion for uh, judgment as a matter of law was January 9th. So long before, so, so the parties at least made their arguments long before we got to today's or yesterday's verdict. Okay, and way, I, I have to, I have to get. Um, I brought it up here. It's blocking uh, Nate's face, but Mark G two ten says yes. It was the Tulsi Gabbard. Yes, yes, goal. I remember it now. That cited, yes. that cited oh. the, the Prager U. Okay, thank you very yeah. much, Mark. We're we're all we're all going see now. It's uh, okay. We got STFU FFS says if you and Tim Kath don't overlap, I'd be here sooner. Oh, I see. I don't I don't pay attention. I don't look at these things. But thank you very much. STFU, FFS. Okay. <laughs> so they made their motion. Uh, they, they, they get you. So everybody, we went over this in one of the last videos, but you, someone makes a motion. They get a response. Then you get a response to the response. Then the issues are joined, so to speak. And then you have arguments. Or were, As far as we know, were there arguments on this motion or not? Mm -mm. I don't remember oral arguments, no. no it's okay. probably be on paper. Okay, so that's interesting. And then the judge... The judge has all the paper, has all the facts, has all the allegations and all the arguments, and then issues a judgment. Okay, so where do we where do we go with this now? Well, at least I, I, I'll I'll start just with where I think the court kind of o overlooked some issues and kind of flubbed the analysis. I thought I thought the judgment was really good as to the issues that applied. I thought the judgment was really good as to the rules that applied. So the first twenty pages of this opinion that came out I thought were really good then on the analysis it kind of like said and then a miracle happened at least to me mm -hmm. it didn't really do a very good job of showing why this was not protected given what was is what issue and they and the judge even said at one point you know it's it's not even in contention that this combination is not rare or or new and I'm like not only is it in contention, it is at this point the central point of contention, whether or not it's new. And this is also where I thought Adam Neely uh, got it a bit wrong. It, it, it's not to say, well, it's just these eight notes. It's just these things. It's the, it's the total combination of everything. And so I thought that the expert for um, Flame had, had it better. It's like he gave like nine different ways using the, the, the BPM, the tone, the scale, the you know, all the different, the, the the overall feel of it and said, well, there's an infringement. I felt like the district court in its analysis kind of blew all that by and didn't give enough um, consideration to the combination and rather looked at the elements in isolation. All right, so, so that was it, my view. Let me let me get us then. I'm gonna I'm gonna t go through this real quick and catch us up to where the court actually does that analysis. So first, I want to remind everybody that copyright infringement means ownership of a valid copyright and copying elements that are original. That's that's key. So it can't just be that you copied something. It has to be that you copied the creative expression, the original work of creative expression. Uh, the sole issue is whether defendants ostinato 2 in dark horse because if you listen to it there's there's a sort of a repeating ostinato before you get to the infringing ostinato whether that infringed upon the joyful noise opening ostinato which is the you know the first thing you hear in in joyful noise um, you can either prove copying with direct evidence or by showing that the defendant had access and that the works are substantially similar. So I don't think there's any direct evidence. We're working on access and substantial similarity, which the court then says here. 
Uh, substantial similarity then in the Ninth Circuit is a two-part test, extrinsic and intrinsic test. The extrinsic test requires that plaintiff identify concrete elements based on objective criteria. So objective means we should all come to the same conclusion. There are two steps to the analysis, identifying the protected elements and determining if the protected elements are objectively similar to the corresponding elements of the second work. A collection of otherwise unprotectable elements may be found eligible for protection under the extrinsic test, but only if those elements are numerous enough and their selection and arrangement original enough that their combination constitutes an original work of authorship. For a plaintiff that seeks to apply this theory of protection to works where there is a narrow range of available creative choices, like music, the defendant's work would nearly, would have to be virtually identical rather than just, uh, you know, somewhat similar in order to, we're not, I'm going to try to avoid using substantially similar because that's the legal term. So it would have to be virtually identical instead of a traditional substantially similar test. Um, yeah, that's the interesting thing because because they were they were talking about. I mean, the, the 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 work as a whole would be protected if the individual components are you know are assembled in the way to make it protectable. And then like the the, the whole idea is like. In music, you're only dealing with one note at a time, and you're only dealing with twelve notes. So necessarily, each individual note is not protectable, but in the combination, they are. Which is where getting into this eight-note ostinato, that it, it becomes like it, this becomes one of those borderline case-by-case -case assessments. Yeah. As to whether or not all of the elements, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and probably get chewed out for agreeing with uncivil law. But when I'm reading the the assessment, which we'll get into. I do tend to get the feeling like we're getting to the point where, yeah, it's eight notes. They're different notes. They're similar notes. They're similar beats. They're similar sound. Um, but they're, they're, they're the basic building blocks and therefore not protectable. Right. Now, where do we get to that? So, by the, by the way, first things first, the, we, we dealt with what the, the motion is a pure matter of law is, is that we don't need a jury for this. It's a pure matter of law. The jury decides fact. The judge decides well, law. That, that's well, sort of what the judge is deciding here, that we don't have to get to the jury on, on this. But the judge actually still deals with that and says that if we, if on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, they decide that we that we do need the jury, then let's have a new trial. And they grant mm -hmm. a, a, a motion for a new trial, basically. Um, and and I, I just want to say when you when you feel like this is a difficult case or it's it's hard to tell exactly what's going on here. Yes, that's exactly correct. Even lawyers are having trouble with how did we get here, because this this particular case is right there on the line. If you if you listen to the two songs, which I'm not going to play on my channel because we already got one copyright claim. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they are th those descending minor ostinatos are very similar and to a jury's ear, it is entirely possible and, and actually happened that they found them to be infringing. I'll be back in one second. Okay, okay. We, we lost Viva. I'll just continue with the extrinsic test here. So the extrinsic test is the objective test, uh, whether the protected elements are objectively similar. Um, the test is critical because copyright law does not forbid all copying, only illicit copying of protected works. If plaintiffs cannot satisfy the extrinsic test for any reason, the inquiry ends and defendants are entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So the initial inquiry is whether any elements of the ostinato in Joyful Noise are individually protected, and if not, whether the unprotectable elements that make up the ostinato taken together in combination are nevertheless entitled to copyright protection. There is generally a low bar for originality in copyright. We call this minimal creativity. Given the limited number of notes and chords available to composers and because common themes frequently reappear in various compositions, many, if not most of the elements that appear in popular music are not individually protectable. And they cite to Nimmer on copyright, who is only mm -hmm. a treatise on copyright, but still gets cited as if it's almost law. Uh, music, perhaps more than any other work of art, borrows and must necessarily borrow. So in other words, to write music, you must borrow from other elements. You know, when I play these notes on, on the piano, you know, everybody else who's making piano music, right, you know, uses those same notes for just different, different ways, different combinations. 
for yeah, this? It, Go ahead. No, it, it is okay. We'll, we'll get into it because it, this is this is like a judgment trying to explain away the jury verdict, which is we're going to break it down to such a to such a discrete point where it's going to be individual notes as opposed to the ostinato yeah. as a whole. And then the question is, is that they go too far? Because if you if you break anything down and do its constituent parts, I mean, I can commit patent infringement by just saying, well, all you did was put a valve here and a hose here and I can 3D print this. So how is that patent infringement? Because any one of these individual well, it. But of course, you know, that's not how how copyright or patent or trademark works. Yeah. Um, if we want to talk about patent law, we can talk about my, my favorite patent law case, Alice which deals with 101 uh, oh. <laughs> subject matter and uh, is exactly this. First like to file. Court, yeah, well, no, 101 is dealing with invention and what, what things qualify as invention in the first place. But it's, it's saying that, you know, you can't reduce things to touch too high a level of abstraction when you're analyzing invent invention uh, eligibility. Because if you do that, nothing would be eligible because, you know, you can abstract anything away to the, the idea. So it's the same sort of problem. It's the idea expression dichotomy, basically. It's, you know, you can't reduce things. And so like, well, did they extract too far in this case is a interesting legal question. And well, let me just get this. I'm going to pull up Real Bamboonga says, how is this case possible? But somehow the key of awesome versus version of Dark Horse isn't infringing. I don't know what that song is. Nope, don't know. But I, but I, so now all, the, all and not to cover my own tushy, but now knowing that this was the original trial judge who rendered this decision, it's still going to the Ninth Circuit for appeal. Uh, that's what the parties say. Yes. Uh, so okay. so Flame has has pledged to appeal to the Ninth Circuit. All right, unless it, unless it settles, but we'll see. So in theory, nonetheless, the Court of Appeal could say no. The trial judge got it wrong on the uh, on the questions of law, and the jury decision should stand. Yeah. Okay, yeah. interesting. Okay, now where were we? Uh, so musical. Well, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Uh, but I wanted to ask because in the the last paragraph of the order, the one where it says that if the extrinsic test is not appropriate, the court conditionally granted a new trial. But wouldn't that be the choice of the appellate, like if the appellate court? If they yeah, they're say, preparing for the appeal. They're saying that if the appeals court grants uh, the the you know, throws out whatever the the lower court has done here, that that yes, we the, the lower court is ready to grant a new trial. Yeah, yeah, but the appellate court can just say no. We're just gonna. We just yeah. Retro. They can do yeah. anything they want. Basically. They don't have to remand it. They can just decide it, especially if it's a matter of law issue. So only if they find a issue for the jury, an issue for the fact finder, some material fact on which a jury reasonably could find one way or the other. Okay, and we got. I'm just gonna pull this one up here. At the moment of silence, we got Leaf's Life Sandra says at at first glad to see Mr. French. Sad not to see Mr. Brody. Glad it became a quartet. <laughs> it is a good. It is a good quartet. Just as long as we can all play. Um, we'll play Dark Horse next time. And we got Joseph Bruno. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So hold on. Now, just clarify that again. For the judge, the judge who in in granting the refiled motion under fifty B says it's dismissed. But if there's if if I'm wrong, there's going to be a new trial. Yes. Yeah, so in the event the Court of Appeals were to find that judgment as a matter of law on the extrinsic test is not appropriate, the court conditionally grants a new trial because it fi because this court, not the appeals court, finds the extrinsic test and damages, uh, the jury's findings, are against the clear weight of evidence. So the judge is basically saying the jury is wrong. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I was going to ask, like, is that is that a common thing for a judge to say? If I'm wrong, then the appeals court can tell me I'm wrong, but I want to say it anyhow because that's what the appeals court is there for in any event. Like, I, I why, do why not do see this very often, no. <laughs> okay. yeah, and, 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 and if he, because there's two tests, the extrinsic test, and what's the other test called? The, the, the intrinsic test. The intrinsic the, the, test. The, the, the subjective or, or reasonable jury test. So, but, so now if that's in the purview of the jury, and the jury's made this, made the decision for the other guy, for the, the Christian rapper, what basis that does it say in here? What basis the judge now has to, to to go forth saying that that their their decision is is it antithetical to law? Is it is there is there any reasoning for that in here? Because that's what it seems like he's saying. He or she is saying. I'm sorry, I don't know if the gender of the judge. I um, well, I think yeah, yeah, I think the judge was saying that the, the judge the, in it was in that section where they broke down the nine elements. They said there's nothing protectable in this. Therefore, there was nothing intrinsic to assess. It was in, it was extrinsically unprotectable, and therefore. 
there was nothing there was no subject matter for the judge for the jury to adjudicate on which which i thought you know which i thought was interesting because if we if we get uh, uh leonard if you can get to the section where he breaks down the nine criteria but yeah we're like, sort of starting here musical okay. elements that are common or trite such as the long short long rhythm chord progressions, tempos, recurring vocal phrases, yeah. uh, hook this phrases, emphasis of strong and weak beats or syncopation, the use of tritones or the basic musical devices in different manners are accordingly not protectable, nor are other elements of uh, ubiquitous or ubiquitous elements in popular music like rhythms, glissandos, chants, the use of horns, jingling or pulsing synthesizer elements. None of that's entitled to protection. These yeah, are building it, blocks. That's where I have an issue with it. That is like that is tantamount to saying that none of the th those are all the essential elements of music. You're saying none mm -hmm. of them are protectable individually. And, yeah, individually yeah. And put together, therefore they can't be protectable. But that's the that's like that's like saying a, uh, I don't know who if you're ABC there's, or there's two part, Those are two separate things. They can be individually protectable un, under certain circumstances, or you can use unprotectable elements in a selection and arrangement and get a protectable work out the other end. Sort of like sausage. It makes sense. Okay, so let's. I mean, I I, I know where I'm disagreeing with it because he breaks it. He does break it down to such a point where he says, all of these syncopation, uh, the you know, the syncopation. What was it? The tone, the sound, the beat, are individually not protectable, and put in this ostinato, they were not protectable because it was just rhythm. It was just a descending crescendo or descending. Uh, um, Minor ostinato, and uh, therefore, as an aggregate, they're not protectable. But that seems as an aggregate that seems to be what music is to me true um mm -hmm. so here's where the, we get to a led zeppelin site and i do not know whether this is the appeals court opinion or not maybe one of us can look it up uh, these building blocks belong in the public domain and cannot be exclusively appropriated by any particular author uh, the Led Zeppelin case holding that commonplace elements that are firmly rooted in a genre's tradition are not copyrightable as a matter of law, and the jury was properly instructed that the de descending chromatic scales, which was, you know, of course, the the sort of baseline uh, to uh, to the opening of Stairway and to the opening of, of, of Taurus, uh, that these descending chromatic scales, arpeggios, and short sequences of three notes are common musical elements and therefore unprotectable. I mean, it's interesting, but but even you know, even a descending uh, scale, depending on the syncopation, depending on the rearrangement of notes, um, that's that's what that's what music is. And I, I understand the rationale here is that they they wanted to like preserve the one four five four in blues music or the standard right. uh, Pachelbel Canon's chord progression to say the chord progression itself is not is not protectable. Right. But you know, at some point there, you get to enough of a, an arrangement that it's that it's protectable. Yeah, like like Green Day's uh, uh, "Do You Have the Time," yeah, exactly. it, which is which is the exact same chord progression. Then you have well, uh, it, yeah, well, Pachelbel's Canon is is a really simple chord progression that's basically almost not a whole lot more than one one four five one. Yeah, it goes uh, one four seven three. Four, five four one or something along those lines yeah it's 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 just a little bit more complicated um but then i like to play the game of hyperbole or book ending um obviously if someone gr took joyful noise and just put it up on their youtube channel that's direct copying so there mm -hmm. is there is something still that's protectable about every song um you know the song itself the whole song 100 percent. that that thing's protectable so how about when we take it down to 80 percent or 60% or 40% or 20% oh, so, or one measure or four so that, measures. That was, that was the interesting thing. Now, th this is where in the in the substance of the experts who testified for uh, Flame the Rapper, where they said uh, it was the other, which way did it go? It went the other way. Sorry, it was um, the name of the guy who did the video. Um, Adam Neely. Adam Neely. So he was saying, look at all these songs that have the same chord the same progression of notes da, ba, ba, ba. and mm -hmm. he's, like, he's going taking like multiple songs but taking songs were and from what i understood from his videos were that those were like incidental trans like tra not transgressions Tra rather, transients they were or of a song. transitions transitions they were like they were not a recurring theme or recurring chorus they were not a, a recurring element it was just like those five notes or those eight notes came to be in an entire piece. Yeah. A distinctive piece, which I thought falsified the argument a little bit to the point where I could understand the flip side, which is 
okay, I'm not just talking about the fact that in a, in a, in a, in a Beethoven sonata, you might have that eight notes progression, but rather it's the beat, it's the theme, it's the sound of the song, and right. it sounds too much like the other one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and, and this is where I feel. This is where I feel Adam Neely really kind of, at least in my view, was unduly reductionist in his video. In yeah. the same way that you, if you look at Access at Awesome, they have a great song, four chord song, where they just play, um, you know, these four chord songs one after another after another, you know, for like five minutes, and it's just you know basically they can run them one into another, another, another because they all have that same chord progression. But that's too simple. You know, what is on screen right now, I think, is the better end of it. You know, where you say, well, look at it. It's it's this thing plus this thing plus this thing plus this thing. It's you're adding so many elements together. And it's like, well, if Adam Neely had said, well, here's a bunch of videos that have all these elements in a combined total, that would have been a much more persuasive argument. But I found it was, I found his argument and I found the trial court's argument both unduly reductionist. They're not giving full faith and credit to the complete composition as a combined whole. And, well, and, 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 yeah, sorry, Adam, and Adam Neely um, maybe confuses how intellectual property law operates. There, there was his video about the 8 billion melodies have been copyrighted and therefore everything's public domain now. That's not how copyright works. Um, the fact that someone has done it before which was one of, another one of the videos and one of his arguments in the Katy Perry thing. That's not how copyright works. D independent artists can create the same thing and were arrived at them independently. What matters is whether they copied from one another, either through direct copying or through access and substantial similarity. So it doesn't really matter whether someone before Joyful Noise and Flame made a descending minor ostinato that then Katy Perry uses later. What matters is whether Katy Perry either directly copied or had access and made it substantially similar. Okay, so now that's interesting, and I want to get to that point right after this because I took away the text so we can all see this. All my favorite lawyers, one stream. Shard <laughs> Alcor's Gaming, thank you very much. Um, so, the, okay, so that's the interesting thing now in law, and that's something that most people don't understand. The fact that it's identical is, in, is not sufficient. It has to be identical with access to because you could have Right. contemporaneous creation you could have accidental creation so it is substantially similar plus the added necessary element of access to whether or not it's subconscious access because there's there's an argument so i didn't even know i heard that song but it was on the radio versus right you know like ripping off access like so I, a, I, a song can be sufficiently famous that access is presumed circumstantially okay and that's so that that's the criteria is that this is the argument from from Flame Rapper was that this is substantially similar, and she had access because it had been viewed 2.6 million times on YouTube. And and the people helping her write her song are musicologists who would have known Flame's song. They would I have. Think known, you got they would a have Grammy too, it. didn't it? It might it might have even won an award, but it definitely had enough views. It was a it was a famous song. There's there's no way that uh, any musicologist worth their salt would would not have known. Maybe they don't go around listening to it and singing it and humming it in their head, but they definitely had heard it or heard of it at some point. And you know, so so access, I don't think was was a major issue in the Katy Perry court, uh, court case. And real Bambuga says, "What happened to the good old days when you want to copy someone's music, hang them by their ankles from a ten-story balcony, and force them to sign Vanilla Ice?" He, this person, he loves Vanilla Ice. That's what happened to Vanilla Ice. So. <laughs> I never nice. heard that. So I, I, <laughs> I have my doubts, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it could have happened. A, a contact, a contract signed under duress is not valid. Yes, this is true. That is yeah. a contract, invalidating a contract. Um, okay, so let's we'll bring up the text now, and we're going to go back to this judgment and uh, try to make sense of it. Okay. At, so now we're, what are we at page? So 10? here we, we started, yes, it's page 10 and we're starting in with the musicologists. So this is the expert. This is not Katy Perry's writers, musicologists. This is the party's expert testimony of musicologists. So I have no idea if these are not, these are not the same people who wrote the thing. These are people, because I know we've, I've used the word musicologist a couple of times. These are the musicologists that are testifying now at the trial. So, and go ahead. So just a quick question. So so these so these experts are testifying at the trial. This is not for the for the extrinsic test. This is for the intrinsic test because they're trying to convince the jury that yeah for the, for the copyright issue, right? This we've is not more or less passed the extrinsic test, or I, I don't actually know how the procedure works here. I, I I imagine the parties are still establishing the full record with their testimony before the jury, 
and the judge hasn't necessarily ruled that you passed the extrinsic test yet. But then when, I, when you think about it, how we talked about it, the ex ex extrinsic test as a matter of law test is a test for the judge. So the judge might have either made a decision before the jury ever heard testimony or is at least going to have to make the decision about the extrinsic test after the presentation to the jury. And initially the judge did allow the thing through under the extrinsic test and allow the jury to find you know, a verdict. And that jury found in favor of flame and so joyful noise to the tune of $2.8 million. If, yeah. if, I'm, if I am flame right now, I am screaming biased judge who let, <laughs> who let it go to jury. And then when he doesn't like the jury's decision, rules against the jury on the refiled motion afterwards when all the evidence had been adduced oh, yeah i would be i would be pissed off and this is where we would get into sometimes when you win you still lose <laughs> yeah a two-week trial the jury hears all the evidence rules in favor but the you know the 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 in not the incompetent but rather the amateur jury doesn't know what copyright is and now the judge overrules their decision on a, on a pure matter of law beautiful yeah. Okay, so want to go we're, crazy what you do. we're trying to summarize quickly here. The plaintiff, so Joyful Noise Flame, their musicologist identified five or six protectable elements, the rhythm, the scale degrees, the melodic shape, the way the melody moves through musical space, the timbre, the quality, the color, uh, the placement of the material in the musical space of the recording. And so that's five or six points, according to them. Then Katy Perry comes along and her team says that it's actually nine things, the melody, the length, eight notes, the pitch sequence, the similar resolution where it drops down one more step there. Um, the, the flame one has two different ostinatos, which is why there's a, maybe a little bit of dispute there. Uh, the rhythm of eight notes, the the square and evenness of the rhythm. So it's an on beat rhythm. It's not syncopated. It's not off beat. Uh, the structural use of the phrase as an ostinato. Not sure what that means. The timbre of the instruments. So the sort of synthesized sound of it um, and the empty and sparse texture of the compositions. I guess the staccato ness and, um, you know, lack of any flow or portamento you know f uh, moving from one note it wasn't it wasn't legato it wasn't uh, a flow from one note to the other it was dot 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 yeah. dot dot you, you know what this judge in, in my humble opinion just did right here is he just described what music is not what this particular mu what not this particular section was this is music all of these elements is what makes music music and not what makes music copyright infringement or or well or the judge will get to the selection and arrangement part we're sta <laughs> we're we're on the individual elements part now um, then they have friends of the court who identified five protected elements the the sequence of notes the temporal spacing the timbre the phrase length and the placement in the recording um, defendants argue that no matter how you look at these elements, none of them can be individually copyright protected as a matter of law. You know, I don't normally emphasize that phrase, but we are on the line between whether we have a judge making a decision in law or a jury making a decision in fact. That is a huge part of this. And I'll intervene here just to say why I'm going to hate this. None of those elements can be protected as a matter of law. Yeah, sound cannot be protected. Rhythm on its own cannot be protected. Uh, the the what's the word? The the tone, the 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 sound. What did they say? Pinge or tinge? None of the elements timbre. can. But timbre. But when they're all put together, that's what makes music music. So sure, none, it's like it's it's all it's a truism almost. Yeah, none of the individual elements can be can be protected. But put together, that's what makes music music. So that's my that's my uh, pre, pre, uh, what is the word? Uh, insight into where I think this decision went wrong. But we'll go. Okay. Uh, Dr. Decker, who was for plaintiffs, ex he was expert, a plaintiff's expert, did not provide testimony that each of the elements he identified are individually original. To the contrary, he testified that no one single element caused him to determine that the works contained protected features that were substantially similar. So that's that's seriously important because the their own expert, uh, Flame Joyful Noises expert. Let me let me just verify this up here. Yeah. It was Dr. Like. Todd Decker for plaintiffs. Yeah, Dr. Todd Decker himself said that those in those when taken individually, none of those elements are uh, protectable under copyright law. And if I may, Leonard, if I may, yeah, I agree with yeah. Dr. Decker. Not so no, 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 uh, ba, 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 like uh, uh, staccato is not protected. Uh, right. Syncopation is not protected. 
timbre is not protected, but you put those three together, that's what makes a music distinct. So, all, of course, the individual elements, the, the what's the, um, the smallest unit of measurement is a plank. Planks are not... <laughs> a plank, not plank lane. <laughs> Planks make up the entire... They make up everything we know. So, like, it, it, it's, it's a truism. It's not a, it's not a defeatist argument. But, okay, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Well, since, since time and space are duality, there's also a, a plank length of time. True. <laughs> which, is, which is also an element of music. <laughs> uh, so the clear, indeed, only implication of Dr. Decker's, Decker's testimony is that if the two ostinatos are similar at all, it is reasonable only as a result of the arrangement of elements within those ostinatos. So the judge is pretty much already done with um, this not being protectable as individual separate elements and only think, as an arrangement. I, I, I think the word arrangement is a mistake. I'd say it's the it's the comp it's the com com combination rather than arrangement because arrangement implies a deliberation in terms of and he gets into this later. This is why I'm bringing it up. It implies a deliberation of how things are set out in a very precise way. But copyright doesn't normally look to sway the brow. It doesn't normally look to you know what put things in a way so if you through some sort of the process, creativity of the arrangement though yeah as opposed so to like, the uh the yeah. effort and time put in that's that's sweat of the brow Sweat of the brow is that i put in a whole bunch of time your honor therefore i should have copyright protection and yeah. no it doesn't it's not how it works no, but here, the, here's a comment by the way which is from cats in cages cats in cages okay uh, can we agree that musical copyright lawsuits should have expert jury, which is one of the very questions. <laughs> you you come into you're, you're talking about a fundamental yeah. part of our law, of our legal system. <laughs> it's of supposed to be a jury of your peers and not a jury of experts. Uh, it's specifically um, not. Uh, however, that might maybe cats in cages might might, um, you know, like like many people uh, not understand what happens to get to a jury though we have had to have the the lawyers for both parties through the judge have had to create instructions for the jury that take away the expert part of it so the jury only has to do very specific things that a jury is more or less capable of doing i'm not saying that there's still not a very reasonable debate about whether a jury should be involved at this point but but it's not just that we just like throw the thing at the jury and be like, what do you think? It's well, but, not but there, quite the, that that simple. But the, there is there is this argument. For, uh, let me just read Daniel Cathers. Are the friends of the court like friends of the show? Amicus curis, friends of the court, are people who want to intervene to give their expertise yeah, to help. Yeah, interested parties who think they have something to add. Can, Sorry, um, I didn't mean to talk about can, can, I, can I make one, one note? How, no. how, yeah. how, how crazy <laughs> it would make me at that my expert is the reason why we got this <laughs> negative ruling. It's like, I paid yeah. this guy thousands of dollars and the judge is saying, got a take it $2.8 million me, dollar judgment and it's yeah. just gone. I don't, think, it's, now, you I, know? Don't think, I don't think the expert made a mistake. I don't think mm -hmm. the expert could have made the alternative argument because the alternative argument doesn't make any sense. So this the alternative is true. argument is that in isolation, they're protectable. That's ridiculous. Of course they're not. But so, but the, so, it, it's just but the thing is that you've paid this expert probably about ten to fifteen thousand dollars to come help your case and he's torpedoed it by accident obviously. At, at, at least the expert didn't have their license revoked as uh, happened to me in one of my cases that I discovered the day of the trial. But well, we don't we learn from our mistakes. The um <laughs> the second question was oh the the whole discussion as to whether or not there should be an, a, a a a trial by experts. This this question comes up in copyright. It comes up in patent where. When you have trial by juries, you say uh, a, a jury of your peers are going to be incapable of understanding the nuances of this highly specialized law. So let's move to administrative judges where you just get into this realm of administrative tribunals, which are, I don't want to say lawless, but above the law potentially. And it becomes more corrupt than leaving it to a jury of your of, of your peers. It's 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 the uh, not the push and pull, but rather it's like sort of up and down of the same system is if it's not a jury of your peers. You get these tri you know administrative judges who who think maybe a little too academically and not well, artistically. But in criminal law, though, the, sometimes you want like like for instance, law enforcement officers. They would rather go with ju with judge judge jury, so you know uh, where a judge would 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 be the jury in their case, than rather a, a pettit jury or a jury of their peers. And the reason why is because th they are more emotionally swayed. You know where you have a, ju a judge who's just you know hey here's the law, I'm going to apply it, so they feel that they'll have a better chance. 
against the judge, especially, you know, I used to be used to call it the Bronx problem. Like if you have a cop who's on trial in the Bronx, you want a judge, you know, you don't want the jury from the Bronx because they're antithetical to cops. So some, you know, it, it works both ways. I can see, I can see ne- positive and negatives on both sides. For sure. Now we've got Real Bambunga who says, Jury of your peers, Morgan. Shut up. <laughs> 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 nice. When you get Just four laps, that's twelve a- peers, <laughs> Morgans, <laughs> all like trying to deliberate. Yeah. Just, just give okay, me the chair. Save us time. Now, gonna, now, I haven't noticed any Russian sex bots. I'm looking and I'm surveying. And if I see a sex bot, I'm gonna get her number and then I'm gonna block her. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Back to the text. So uh, we still have um, uh, the nitty gritty to go through for selection of arrangement. I skipped ahead a couple pages because the judge just basically goes through those elements of the individual parts. And fi- we, we've already talked about it a lot. So I don't think we I think we can safely skip that. Yeah. Um, so protection for combination of elements. The court's inquiry does not end here. Plaintiffs may still prove infringement of their ostinato if they can demonstrate that it is comprised of a protectable combination of otherwise unprotected elements. These elements must be numerous enough in their selection and arrangement, original enough to warrant protection as, quote, unoriginal work of authorship, which is a copyright definition. Since a selection and arrangement of copyright protects the particular way in which the artist uh, artistic elements form a coherent pattern, synthesis, or design, it is not enough to assert a combination of unprotectable elements without explaining how those elements are particularly selected and arranged. And that's citing to the Led Zeppelin case, by the way. Mm. Yeah, and that's interesting. They're just uh, first of all, the Satava decision seems to be one that comes up a lot in this decision, which might be worth looking up on its they're, own. They're but... gonna they're gonna get to it below. Okay. Um, so to determine whether the various compositional elements of plaintiff's ostinato are entitled to this sort of copyright protection in the aggregate, the court the court Kurt hi Kurt the court first reviews the relevant precedents. Three Boys was one case. The Ninth Circuit affirmed a finding of copyright protection based on the combination of five otherwise unprotectable elements, the hook, the cadence, the instrumental figures, the verse-chorus relationship, and the fading ending. Three Boys concerned whether Michael Bolton's 1991 song, Love is a Wonderful Thing, in its entirety infringed upon the Isley Brothers song of the same name in its entirety, which I actually don't remember what that one sounded like. <laughs> well, he's got a bad start if the song is the same name as the one that he's alleged to have sung. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After a trial in which Bolton's defense expert conceded that he had not found the combination of unprotectable elements in the Isley Brothers song in any prior compositions, the jury entered a verdict that found infringement based on a unique compilation of those elements. So yes, that was infringement based upon an arrangement of unprotectable elements. I can, when I hear Michael Bolton, all I can think of is Captain Jack Sparrow, and that's um, it's burnt in my brain right now, but that's the only thing I can think of is Office Space. Yeah, Office Space. Office Space. <laughs> what? Office space. Is, Bolton, is Bolton in Office Space? No, but no, there's no, a character the named Mike Bolton who doesn't want to be called Michael Bolton because... <laughs> well, I have just... I mean, I have just, it's, the world. it's kind of akin to someone being named Alexa these days. <laughs> <laughs> the Ninth Circuit in Swirsky considered whether the first measure of the chorus of plaintiff's song, one one of those love songs, or one, what is it? One of those love songs, allegedly infringed by Mariah Carey's song, Thank God I Found You, whether it did not constitute original expression as a matter of law. She contended in part that the allegedly infringed seven note first measure of plaintiff's song lacked protection because of its brevity. The Ninth Circuit rejected this argument, explaining that while a single musical note is too small, so there's your plonk length, a unit to attract copyright protection, uh, a, an arrangement of a limited number of notes can garner copyright protection. It cannot be said as a matter of law that seven notes is too short to garner copyright protection. So at least we know from a previous case, Swirsky, that seven notes can be copyright protected. We have eight notes here, so we're still game. Then there's it, Williams. This, this is how the judge covers his butt to say, like, I've considered one decision which was even shorter than this one, which I'm about to dismiss. So don't accuse me of having ignored relevant case law, if I may. Right. Yeah. So then we we go to another case in Williams. Um, 
we while we discussed the course the court held there that the virtually identical step of the Satava case did not apply to the musical composition at issue, the court in Williams embraced and applied the principle that a combination of elements, which includes again, you had mentioned Satava. I don't know how you pronounce that, Sadova, Sadova. The combination of elements there, portions of signature phrases, hooks, bass lines, keyboard chords, harmonic structures, and vocal melodies may receive copyright protection if sufficiently original. At trial, the court or the jury found that the combination from Marvin Gaye's song, Gotta Give It Up, was protected, that the thick parties infringed oh, on the protected elements, returned a verdict for the gays and awarded damages. I mean, these, I, I love these last names. They're exactly the first words I would not want to use on YouTube. Uh, critically, the thick parties <laughs> failed to make a Rule 50A motion for judgment as a matter of law at trial, which precluded consideration of a Rule 50B motion for judgment as a matter of law. So it sounds like you can't make this motion for a judgment, for a renewed judgment after the fact if you didn't make a motion in uh, before. I, I haven't actually done a Rule 50 motion, so I'm guessing here. But so that sounds like a procedural failure on the part of Robin Thicke's attorneys, which is why the Marvin Gaye case worked out the way it did. Maybe. That's interesting. Accordingly, the Ninth Circuit's review of the jury's finding of a protected combination was confined to the fact bound, highly deferential review that did not permit the panel to revisit the protectability issue. So here we're getting an answer on the Marvin Gaye Robin Thicke case. The, they, they did not challenge the jury's finding pr procedurally, and so they did not get to do this renewed motion for a judgment as a matter of law. Otherwise, it sounds like the court's ready to overturn that one too, but too late. Yeah. Um, so it is able to, even if the judges, even if the court is able to determine substantial similarity under the eccentric test as a matter of law, because it was not challenged on, as with a, with a renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law and an original motion for judgment as a matter of law, that that case does not play out the same as this case, or rather, this case does not play out the same as that case. That's very interesting, and all, that's also sort of the court's subtle way of um, saying that someone should have done their job better in a previous file, but. You, the, the a very polite way of saying it, yeah. I don't know, that just can't do the job for them. And the I'll objection just wasn't that just means the objection was preserved on appeal, right? Is that that what the court's saying? Uh, right, right. So you can't make the judgment as a matter of law, uh, motion or or argument in the Marvin Gaye Robin Thicke case because that wasn't raised in the lower court. Yeah. Which is, okay. this is like my my nightmare as an attorney is like, I'm going to forget something and then just totally lose like on a technicality later on. Got to object but, on the record. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Real Lambuga says, Michael Bolton was in office space until the No Talent Ascom became famous and started winning Grammys. <laughs> that, I have no knowledge of this, nor do I know if he's an untalented ass clown and we got uncivil law. Oh, he's not. He's Michael Wait, Bolton hey, isn't bad. Hey. His music is just. It's 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 um uh, his, mainstream. It's not uh, it's Jack not Sparrow, jazz. Let's put it no, that way. His Captain Jack Sparrow with Lonely Island is the one of the greatest songs of all time, and we've got Uncivil Law, which is right there. That guy right there. Yep. The thick versus the gays. Sorry, <laughs> not. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, Everybody wants me to be demonetized on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm so innocent. I didn't even know what you were getting at. Okay, bringing back up the text right now. Okay. Oh, although neither the district court nor the Ninth Circuit had the opportunity to consider the question of protectability as a matter of law, again, matter of law, after all the evidence had been presented, the court's conclusion that the jury could have found the six individually unprotectable music elements identified at trial is informative. Then we get to another case, Erickson v. Blake. The court in District of Oregon squarely found a protectable combination of otherwise unprotectable music elements. That case involved two musical compositions that transposed the digits of pi, so 3.14159, to a set of musical notes deployed as a motif. The plaintiff alleged that defendant's composition infringed in its entirety upon the plaintiff's composition in its entirety. The defendant moved to dismiss the complaint pursuant to the extrinsic test on the grounds that the works lacked any similarity beyond the unprotectable idea of putting the digits of pi into music. The court agreed that pi is a non-copyrightable fact and that the transcription of pi to music is a non-copyrightable idea, but did not end there. 
After filtering out those unprotectable elements of the allegedly infringed comp composition's primary motif, the court considered whether the composition's remaining pattern of other musical elements, scale, rhythm, harmony, embellishment, variation, comprised a combination of elements protectable pursuant to Apple Computer and Sadova. The court concluded that they did. The copyrightability of the song is not the melody based on Pi, but the fitting together of this sequence with other melodious phrases into a unique composition. It identified the cadences, flourishes, harmonies, structure of the remaining composition to conclude that plaintiff had a thin copyright in the song as a whole that protects the, his work from only virtually identical copying. First of all, I, I, if I'm the lawyer in the file that says transposing pi into music is not in and of itself copyrightable, I'm appealing that to the Supreme Court of the cosmos because I don't, yeah, care, I'm that pi, I don't care that pi is a concept. So are, so are what are the things? Um, uh, the, well, not, plus pi, the, plus the, the word, pi has been put to music before. Well, it was a great, it was a great educational. What about I have, that? I have, to, oh, I have to go see that now, but the, I, the, the, the original idea of putting five, five nine two six five three five seven five three eight nine seven five three two three eight four six two. Well, that mnemonic yeah. actually obviously yeah. worked. <laughs> oh no, hold on. So, yeah, there you go. No, I, I, what I was visualizing not that they were doing like the the the, the words of pi, but rather they were converting pi into a musical expression, like I don't know some algorithmic. Expression on music. I wasn't thinking they were saying three point one for one five nine two six five three nine seven three two three. It was from the seventies, and it had a re really bad, like cheesy robot, and all the kids looked really excited when the robot walked in the room. It was, <laughs> I think it was Electric Company or something like that. But yeah, that one's mm. burned into my mind. I got that. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Okay, we'll keep we'll keep going with this wonderful enthralling decision now <laughs> in Stefani which I'm assuming is Gwen Stefani a court in this district considered whether the distinctive pronunciation and ry rhyming use of particular lyrics on a particular beat rhythm recur recurring vocal phrases the presence of tritones qualified the plaintiff song for copyright protection by virtue of their arrangement in an original matter the the court concluded that these features were not voluminous enough to provide the quantum of originality or you know, quant quantity, quantum of originality, the, the plank, enough plank lengths, plank lengths of originality needed to merit copyright protection and enter judgment for defendant as a matter of law. Similarly, in Cottrell v. Spears, who I'm assuming is Britney Spears, what you see is what you get, infringed upon the following compositional elements of what you see is what you get from, I guess, Cottrell. Two identical pitches at the opening of each song's chorus, two verses that begin and end with an A minor chord, the repetition of a particular note three times in their verses, and the setting in 4-4 four, four time. After concluding that none of those elements was individually protectable, the court cited the Ninth Circuit precedent and considered whether a combination of the unprotectable elements in the plaintiff's song may nevertheless qualify for copyright protection. The court cited the Ninth Circuit's decision in Sadova for the rule that those elements must be numerous enough and their selection and arrangement original enough to warrant protection and concluded that the same cannot be said in the Spears case, especially in light of the fact that they are common to this music type. On this basis, the court granted Spears judgment as a matter of law. She was the defendant. Wow, this judge, this judge is going through so much case law. This is yeah, like, really like don't I want to be make appealed. Sure. Oh no, yeah, I was, yeah, I was like, we're only on page after. seventeen. I was like, right up until <laughs> page twenty, I was great. And so we're doing great. We did great issue, great rule. That was page, the first twenty pages. Then wow. analysis was like dot dot dot, and then right to the conclusion. And here's what I haven't gotten much farther past this, so we might have to rely on Kurt then for the conclusion. In view of these decisions, the court now turns to whether the musical elements in Joyful Noise are numerous enough and arranged in sufficiently original manner to warrant copyright protection. The court concludes they now, do not. I was going to stop you for the, because I was going to say, at this point, I don't know where the court was going to come out on because it was, <laughs> the, the case law was all over the place. It was like, what are we going? Where are we going here? But go ahead. Go ahead this, this is what I would call the confuse and conquer type analysis, where it's, it's you throw Confu in. A bunch I of love that confuse and conquer. No, you throw <laughs> you throw in a ton of other decisions, which you know very few people are going to read in detail. They set out some general principles, which may or may not be, you know, entirely representative <laughs> of the lawsuit. And now he's going to go to the nine elements. And you know what he's going to do. Well, now that he yeah. said it, he's going to go to the nine elements. They're not individually protectable. Therefore, as a whole, it's not enough. 
You know, if, if the ostinato does not fit, you must acquit. <laughs> wow. Okay, great. But he's, he's giving you so much confusing case law. It's like whatever he comes up with, he can defend it. Via, well, look, look, just read above. You know, well, the, the interesting thing is for the, for the appeals decision, you know that the lawyers are going to go through Sadova, Spears, Stefani. They're going to go through look all those decisions, what they were in substance. But um, each side has so much to go through. They can say, oh, look, he, he said he's, you know, he cited this case for me, he cited this case for them. It's, it's crazy. My computer's going, my, my battery's going to go dead. Hold on. Um, Bambuga says, so pie's related to this case in American Pie where Jim's dad walked in on him. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh. Hit on, on Tampa. I'm not reading the rest of that. <laughs> Flaming hot, baby. I, was, I saw the ads for the prequel to American Pie, and unfortunately, I saw it with one of my kids who asked what was going on. Ah, uh, yes. No, uh, no, no nothing. He's just he's just assaulting a pie. And, and by the way, now the Russian sex bots are coming. I know as a result of that they're coming. Okay. Nice. So, so So Swirsky <laughs> contemplates the possibility that an eight note musical phrase may be entitled to copyright protection pursuant to Sadova. The parties here have not cited any authority, let alone binding authority, holding that an otherwise unprotected music phrase, isolated from the rest of a musical composition, in fact warranted copyright protection. There, there, there's where I'm starting to agree with you, Kurt. Like, is that disingenuous? The, no one's arguing. Did the court this. just punt? Did the court just yeah. say, "Well, you never said"? No, but not to the other way. The, the, the court. No, but where, where I really lost it is the next paragraph down. That's where what? I really lost it. Where it's no, wait, don't, don't get it again. Go back. Go back. That's up, where I really lost it. The court. They said the parties have not cited any authority, let alone binding authority. Well, if they didn't cite any authority, it implies no binding authority. If he's adding, let alone no binding authority, they cited some authority that he disagrees with. That. Those two statements are mutually incompatible. If they cited no authority, you don't need to add in brackets, let alone binding authority. There and is that, a different kind of authority in the United States, persuasive sorry. authority. Well, then let's shut my big mouth and tell me what. Yeah, so you know, this is real quick. This is important for everybody. Um, it, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is not beholden to the other 12 circuits. Sure. Um, it, 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 it can consider the other 12 circuits rulings, but it doesn't have to. It's only persuasive. To consider the other one so only if it's a good idea you know a court court in um so i i just did a, a a rebuttal in a motion to dismiss in one of these ip addresses not a person cases and so i've got i've got persuasive authority all over the place because not every court has ruled on every issue in the idea that an ip address is does not equal a particular person so you know jurisdiction we need to identify a particular person um an IP address alone does not identify a particular person. Therefore, you know, jurisdiction can be an issue in those cases is really what I'm talking about there. So the Ninth Circuit, it, it, or rather the district court in this case, wants to see Ninth Circuit or Supreme Court opinions. Those are binding authority. Um, not even, help, help me out with this one, Kurt, if you, have, if you disagree or if you agree. Um, not even other cases in the Central District of California are necessarily binding on the Central District of California. You are correct, sir. That's true, yeah. It but needs to they... be an appeals court opinion, which includes the Supreme Court. But, would, but as far as my understanding of authority goes, it would be any judgment of the court. No. No. Published opinions, no. basically. Yeah. Published opinions, even so if published it's opinions court. are ones that the Ninth Circuit or well, su su all, all Supreme Court decisions are published, right? Um, well, yeah. they, I can oh. think of maybe like when they no. do the certiorari denial, but they still issue a ruling. Is that binding? No, yeah, they pub well, no because the, if they don't hear the case, there's no binding. Okay, decision. so a pub. So when the Ninth Circuit or any other circuit issues an opinion, they designate it for publication or not publication. This leads to very fun questions on my channel. How can you read this to us? It says not for publication. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what that means. That's not what that means. <laughs> so it just means that it's not binding precedent when it says that. Okay, interesting. Now hold on, I got to get to these two, these three, I think. Bambunga says that I know I'm not going to be able to finish it. The judge found that Spears got into Gwen Stefani making. <laughs> okay, this, he's he's going to get da he's going to get dad puns all night long. Um, okay, now next one is Anev lawyer lawyers are dance moves able to be copyrighted? Can I sue Fortnite? We, we talked about one. this. We've all yeah. talked about this. Carlton, Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was the the the, the, the backpack kid. He was there was a, there was yeah. I think we've, oh, we've all done videos on this at some point. Um, 
Now, I and here, yes, this goes to the selection and arrangement of individual elements. You've got a limited number. You've got limbs. You've got a head. You've got feet. You could only do so much with these with these things. There's a limited number of moves, so you well, can that, only make a selection and arrangement copyright only if it is sufficiently long. And and the courts have precedent on how much choreography really, or how much a dance move really needs to turn into choreography that can be described and repeated as part of a longer performance. That's when it's protected. Dance moves alone yeah. or not. Okay, now I missed I missed Caleb Crow. I think. Um, did I, are the sex bots taking over? <laughs> okay, I, miss, I missed Caleb Crow. I think I missed the super chat, but it says it's quite difficult to even find original chord progressions. I've often searched the hook theory site and realized I was copying more unique ones I've heard without consciously realizing it. If I can find your your super chat, I'm going to bring it up. It's a yellow super chat, and I don't know how I fell so far behind. So I'm going to see if I can get this. But I mean, that's that's chord progressions, I guess. Well, I mean, chord progressions is, is where it breaks down to the plank theory that it's those are not copyrightable or protectable. Yeah. But what you add to it to make it um, to make it uh, unique is where it becomes protectable. Hold on, I think I'm going to get to it right now here. Sorry, I don't know why it was so far up the page. Um, here it is. Caleb Crow. So that, then that brings us into the dance move, the Carlton, the backpack kid who like, you know, it's it's. It's a three sec. It's a it's a basically a one, one gyration move. It can't be protectable because it is it is no more basic as a plank move than that. But do like that coupled with a few other pieces of choreography, and then you can have a an expression of work. But then it has to be published and it has to be known because doing it in your room and shooting on your iPhone doesn't make it protectable. But um, no, that I mean that's 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 where the real that's where the real line is. Not in this particular case. Where he says, yeah, it's, it's an eight note progression with nine distinct elements to it, but each individually are not protectable. Therefore, it's not protectable. Yeah. And that's where we get into it. That's where we get into an so issue. Can we go? Can we go to that next paragraph on the next page yep. down where I really <clears throat> lost my crap? Let's it's do this. Like, one. It is undisputed in this case, even viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the plaintiffs, which is the standard that we're on here, a summary judgment standard that the signature elements of the eight note ostinato in joyful noise, the three, 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 two, two pitch sequence, the resolution of that sequence with a three, two, one, five sequence, and even rhythm without syncopation and its development across a sparse texture is not particularly unique or rare as a combination, even in its deployment as an ostinato, prior compositions, including prior works composed by the parties, as well as what all agree is a separate non-infringing ostinato in Dark Horse, all contain similar elements. Okay, someone has to let me know if I'm, I'm misreading this, because when I read this, and I still read it, I'm like, the court is out of its mind. Well, <laughs> it's like, it's, un, it's undisputed <clears throat> that all this stuff is not a particularly unique or rare combination. Uh, no, it is, it, in fact, extremely disputed that the, exactly that. What are you talking not, about, Corey? It's not just that. It's not just that, but it's so rare that if you go, dun, 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 everybody knows what you're talking about. It's not It's not common. Yeah. And it's, not, it's, it's supremely distinct. The only question is, did you know of of a uh, flame the Christian rapper song before Katy Perry's? And if you did, you probably put the two and two together. But this well, this, hold, hold this I, sentence is so wrong. I'm like, you get no points. We're all dumber for having listened to it. God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> <laughs> God have mercy on your soul. I, I I do have to disagree with you on civil. I, I, only reason why is because they cite right there on on the page. They huh? cite the, the plaintiffs the uh, the plaintiffs expert. See trial transcript. Blah blah blah. blah testimony of Doctor Ferrat. That's where they're getting it. That's why they're saying it's undisputed. I would love, but to I don't. This, I don't. But this. I don't think I don't read that either. Because okay, yeah, discussing the presence of pitch in an even rhythm. Yeah, okay. Oh, that is. But that's not what we're talking about. Because in this, it talks about the eight note, the three 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 two two resolution, and then if you go to the expert, there's like those nine different factors all in combination. So according to because we read it earlier, I don't yep. have to speculate. It was in the opinion. Whereas but like look according at to this same guy, he's like, oh, here's the nine different things that make it unique, and therefore in combinations undisputed. Then combinations not rare. Get out of here. Get but out he, of here, district the judge. The judge is the judge is citing to the expert for this for this claim. The judge I don't is think citing. He's saying I don't think he said fairly. I agree with you though. Yeah, thank it's, you. It's, it's it's undisputed. Even viewing the evidence 
in the in the light most favorable to plaintiffs, that implies it is disputed, but that he's reading it in the manner to give them the big the biggest benefit of the doubt, which it's right, because it it's, be it's defendant's motion that we're on, so he's giving the most benefit to the plaintiffs who are the non-moving party, which yeah, is our but, summary but which, judgment standard. Which which implies that it is in fact disputed at the very least, because if it weren't disputed, they would have consented to the motion. So presumably, there's a dispute somewhere. It's, it is disingenuous, maybe oversimplified, and I would love to know what part, because it is nice to say I refer to the expert testimony at pages without actually including the section, even in the. Um, uh, Sargon of Akkad, they included the references or at least the citations to the, the portion. I mean, all I have to do is scroll like it 10 more right pages up the, all I have to do is scroll 10 more pages up the opinion where he, the same judge, 10 more pages up said, this expert said, here are the nine different things that make this unique. I'm like, I just have to read like, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, so that's where I gave up. Hold yeah, on. I'm not I, sure I, how I, it's undisputed when literally that's what we were talking about before was that there were these disputes over whether these nine things could be protectable. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you guys. I, I think this is definitely uh, it's disputed, but I, I do think the judge goes out of his way to you know to 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 more or less kill this this expert because he puts her you know Mary was it merrily we we roll along jolly old Saint all. Nicholas yeah, yeah so so he's 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 hanging his whole issue on hey light most beneficial to the plaintiff he is the plaintiff's witness saying this is this is not enough so I'm going to say it's undisputed it's not enough I I kind of wonder is this a situation where the judge got the let let the thing get to the jury the jury ruled the way they did the judge let that go through and then after hearing from the parties they're like how do we correct this travesty of justice and and find in favor of katie perry and this is more or less just the you know a little bit of word salad you know we're just throwing words at it and we just because we really just want a certain result and as opposed to explaining so it properly conclusory because in the, in the earlier 20 conclusive. pages the earlier 20 pages we had a great setting out of the issue yeah. we had great setting out of the rule here's all this wonderful case law so we got our issue we got our rule and then we got to analysis it's undisputed <laughs> i'm like what yeah. uh, we were not gonna oh. do any analysis apparently i guess <laughs> but you, so we, you, we've you, got irk you, you know you know what you have here you have a judge trying to save his ass from appeal that's what this judge is trying to do i think this judge saw an appeal coming down thought and thought that hey i have to save this so that's why you that's why it's written up this way at the end okay well it's undisputed here it is and if i'm appealed and they reverse it saying i'm wrong then we'll go for a new trial. Then, then, well or, or well the court of appeal could then say or we just stick with the original judgment of the jury they could do that, right? Yeah, they there's, do that. there's, yeah. yeah, there's two options here: is the judgment as a matter of law or new trial. Um, the appeals court could did could uh, deny, um, or reverse. Excuse be, me, this judge. I want to be decision. a federal judge. I'd be better. <laughs> well, hold on. Couldn't couldn't the, couldn't the federal court just say, okay, you know, everything is good, and there's no need for a new trial? Yeah, based on a matter of law, and it's done. Yes, so. that's that's option one. Option two is they reverse uh, or or at least uh, go go for a new trial. Or option three is they completely reverse and say no, lower court judge, you know the jury got it right and leave it in place. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. And Bambuga, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to finish this con this comment, but and therefore the judge found that sticking spears into Stefani while binding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're getting nice. we're getting off the deep end. Okay, the so, um, but you have to say it properly though. Do you know how to I say this properly? Which Where part circus of it? State of the art. <laughs> He's got to get. Oh God! Circus, circuit yeah. City. You know you got. See, God, yeah, you know what's City. Up. For so long. <laughs> okay, so no, let, let's get. Let's the, get. The, the court the, moves uh, on to other elements. Oh, you you know, is 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 there anything else that could be protected? And they talk about the synthesizer sound. Uh, but he sa the judge says that it would not transform joyful noise into a protected expression. Synthesized timbre is a common element of contemporary popular music. So just well, the fact that we've added, you know, item number ten of nine uh, nine items, we now are adding ten. That it was a synthesized sound, a, a synthesizer sound. Uh, well, the co it's a common element in contemporary popular music. So a relatively common eight note combination of unprotected elements played in a synthesized sound is not so original as to warrant copyright protection. So this is what yeah. you said. So he's doing what you said before, where he's taking the car and saying each piece, the, the tires, the steering wheel, but he's not saying the whole car. He's looking at all these. Yeah, he's looking at each pieces. piece in isolation. 
He's saying yeah. each piece. He's doing exactly what he's not supposed to do. He's looking at each piece in isolation and saying each piece of this is not protected. But that's yeah. not the issue. No, but that, that is that is not the issue because that is like saying liter- that is like saying that every note every note of Beethoven's sonata is not protectable because it's just a note of the scale and notes of the scales are not are they're like they're the basic building blocks and exactly. they're taken as a whole they can't be protectable. It, that's I mean it's fundamentally incompatible with my understanding of of of, of copyright protection. Yeah, let alone we do a reductio ad absurdum. It's like no no music should ever be copyrighted ever. So because all 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 music is is just well it's just one note at a time. In a pitch, so you know, none of it's ever copyrightable. I mean, what is this? No, and and and, uh, and real Van Gogh, Bo- it says this one I can read. Any judge trying to reverse this on appeal will have to pretend they read this entire stupid ruling. Um, well, they, not not even that, but they're gonna the, the, on the court of appeal, they're gonna read this ruling. They're gonna have to go back and review all of the citations. They're gonna review all of the evidence, just not the jury's deliberation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, on my stream, Matt Arnold gives five dollars. Thank you. So, what do you all think about the argument that says cases like this show the need to reduce the scope of copyright? I don't know if we need to reduce the scope of copyright so much as this shows how hard it is to explain where the where exactly the line is between not infringement and infringement. It's it's almost like it's there's no bright line rule, and we really would like a bright line rule. But you see four lawyers on this stream disagreeing occasionally and agreeing occasionally about how this should be done. Here's a judge who doesn't quite have it figured out yet. And now we're going to go up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals if, if Flame wants to. And they're going to try and explain it. And maybe they'll do a good job because Ninth Circuit usually does a pretty good job of explaining things. Whether you agree or disagree with what they say, they still do a pretty good job of, agree, of, 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 of explaining things. And speaking of hard lines, it was literally blurred lines, Alan Thicke with Marvin Gaye's song. That yes. there was so yeah, and, yeah. And now, that's one of the cases where I heard both songs and had no idea that there was even an overlap. Like I would have never, uh, I would have never associated the two songs together versus Katy Perry and Flame, where I would have naturally thought they were part of the same song. Uh, Satriani versus Coldplay, I would have thought they were the same song. Um, blurred lines, I didn't even hear it, uh, let alone you know, think it was close enough for a judgment, but there, there is, there's, there's no hard line. It's a purely case by case, yeah. depending on the judge who can override the jury if they want to make a, a point of law. And I haven't read that case and I haven't read the Vanilla Ice case, uh, but it, it's going to matter whether they handled it differently or this. So it's not, again, judges aren't prescient, judges aren't om- omnipotent um, or omniscient. Um, and a lot of people assume that when these things get to court, the judge is going to try and make the right decision. No, the judge makes a decision within the boundaries of the law. And so if if there was a bad jury decision, but the parties didn't make or or what the correct party didn't make a motion to, you know, overturn that verdict at the right time, then you got the Marvin Gaye Robin Thicke case, for example, which we was explained above. Oh, interesting. Okay, now, uh, well, let's. Uh, we're, uh, yeah, okay. Let's get to the end of this. How how far are we from the end of the judgment? Uh, still ten pages, but uh, we're getting to the point where I haven't read it yet. Uh, uh, but ultimately, the, the 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 so the judge. I mean, we can we can skip to the the punchline. The judge says, as a pure matter of law, I'm overturning the deci- not overturning, but rather dismissing this on a pure matter of law. But ultimately, saying if the if I'm wrong then I still submit it to a new trial by jury or defer to the to the yeah. judgment of the jury, which said there was copyright infringement. Or, or So, or... so re- real quick here, the judge is basically saying, to, to sort of accelerate this a little bit, the judge is basically saying that at this level of abstraction where we have these nine or ten elements, I was going to start playing, you know, a, a synthesis it doesn't even play anymore. I don't know what I did wrong. Um, that, that we don't have, uh, you know, these, these, these individual elements are not protected. So maybe we could still find substantial similarity if they are if the two works are virtually identical and the judge says they are not virtually identical here so therefore not copyright infringement the yeah, evidence in this case does not support a conclusion that the relevant ostinatos in dark horse and joyful noise are virtually identical and how could they be virtually identical if they didn't if they were not if all of those nine elements were not sufficiently identical yeah. but and, and and I think the virtually identical would have had a relation to the um, uh, not exposure, but what's the word? Um, 
access to the mu- access to it. What was the, what was the criteria that we had earlier? Access and substantial similarity. Access, a, 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 yeah, access and substantial similarity, which is if they're virtually identical, even th- that had to relate to whether or not there was access, nonetheless. Because if there was no access, then that still would have been uh, non-infringing, right? The uh, they're not virtually identical, but if they th- that was based on the fact that there was no access to the music. Uh, this is based on they're assuming access. They, they have assumed access, so we only need to prove substantial similarity here. But the, the standard for substantial similarity in a music case is going to be more than those individual elements individually, but rather a selection of arrangement, a selection and arrangement. So hold on, since they're not virtually identical, and that does not matter about the access, if they were virtually identical, if they were to be virtually identical, but there was no deemed access, yeah, I Would think we skipped conflict? ahead. They bas- uh, we might have skipped ahead. At some point in here, the court said in the alternative that there's no protection at all. Then it's a light copyright, and therefore you'd have to find this virtual identical nature. Yes. So because okay. there's a deviation. So it, first of all, there's no copyright. But if there is, it's of a kind that doesn't really count. And so therefore, we we is not enough infringement. So, okay. Yeah, and, and remember, two artists can can come to the same conclusion. They can create the same work as long as that was there wasn't access to the other artist's work. And I believe we even have a case. I don't remember the name of it, and maybe I'll maybe I'll put it on the list to to look it up and and do a, a story on it on our channel. But there were two artists, uh, you know, one in America, one in in Europe, that created the same poem or something, and independently and actually published them at the almost exact same time and they one of them sued the other and it was determined that since there was no access there could not be substantial similarity and therefore no copyright infringement well, that, that was my understanding of how cubism came to be is you had Braque and picasso at the same time creating the same magnificent style of art totally independently but yeah they had the same idea at the same time uh bambunga says will the broad Uncivil, Brody, uncivil French fry stream continue. Will they make it through this slog of a case? Find out next time. Same fry, same channel. By the way, <laughs> let's, let's make predictions here. Who's predicting what? Um, I don't, it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to predict. But I think that the best, either the court is going to uphold it on the light copyright or, or uphold the jury verdict because I don't. I, I think the best idea is a new ver- a new trial with uh, some new instructions on the, the nuanced element. So I'm going to say new trial. That's my bet. New trial. I, I, I think it's, I think although it's poorly reasoned, I think it's, it's tough to reason. Um, I think the judge will, the, the uh, appeals court will actually uphold this renewed ju- motion for judgment as a matter of law. And Katy Perry will continue to be the winner in this case. I, I doubt this will go up to the Supreme Court. I, I'm mm-hmm. even I even have my doubts that that flame will. Well, I have my doubts that they'll appe- that they'll appeal, but my doubts are right there on the line. So I, I could see it being appealed. It is a two point eight million dollar judgment if they win. So there's a reason to appeal. But I, I, I already sort of had my thoughts that the ostinato thing was maybe a little bit too thin to be a copyright infringement. But you know who am I? I you know I'm just a I'm just a lowly copyright attorney trying to to do my best here. But I've got I've got these mountains that are these judges. They should know better, right? I, even I make the mistake of assuming they're omniscient. Nate, you're gonna you gonna uh, you, go, you go I, first. No, I I just I just don't know. I, I, I I'm I'm kind of torn because I I think there's there's a I think there's a pretty decent argument for both sides. So I, I'm I'm not. I, I'm 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 feeling like this will be overturned, but I, I don't know. I'm 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 really lost here. I'm I'm, I'm I don't know. I, I now I now I have to go read these twenty something pages because now you guys are forcing me to read this thing because now I'm still curious. It, <laughs> well, it's just, it's just wow. Here's the spoiler alert. It's piano. never going to go to appeal because they're going to settle for about seven hundred thousand dollars. Well, if you're ever looking for yeah. something to read to your kids at night, they could got, they could end up uh, settling. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, my my bet would be that neither of them are going to want to take a chance on appeal because now you have both arguments in favor of both decisions. Two point eight million. There we go. It's, it's a lot of money. Flame the rapper would be happy with eight hundred thousand to a million. Katy Perry can more than afford it and walk away the with the big W from the decision settlement without going to appeal. That's my prediction. 
So but Bevo, she already had a judgment against her, right? Say it again. She already had this already a judgment against her, right? Well, no, but now we got this one which says she's right. So she, she already yeah, got this the overturns. Yeah, the, yeah, this overturns the, the jury. Uh, what was the question the person just had about? Uh, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, no. Said, what, I just thought I would I, do a quick summary now that I got my piano working again here. No, no. It, it, okay, hold on. So the it was here. It says I'm late to the party. Someone fill me in. I'm late. Never heard of Never the suit. Never heard of the suit. <laughs> so so you, you missed a lot. But basically, if you listen to Flame's joyful noise, it starts out like this. And if you listen to Katy Perry's Dark Horse, after the introduction of, I don't know, eight bars or so, a very, very similar, um, I, there's no dispute there, it's very similar, sounding ostinato plays in the background as well. And the question was whether that was enough for copyright infringement. The jury said, yes, it was enough for copyright infringement. Now the same judge in the same case has entertained a motion to overturn that jury's verdict. I'm looking at the wrong camera again. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the judge overturned the jury's verdict, and this is still at the district court level, so now we get to go up to the appeals court level, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, if, uh, if flame... Uh, you know, from Joyful Noise um, decides that they want to appeal. All right, now we got N N Nandita Hari says, if they start looking at each element singularly to try to judge this, it will open a can of worms in the music industry no one wants to open. Sort of my, sort of my reflex also is that you're breaking it down to an absurdity of an argument, which is individually every note is not copyright it's like every, it's like a, a novel is not copyrightable because it consists of individual letters letters yeah, yeah yeah or Each words letter. which everybody has words so how can you copyright a book no yeah. it's it's the arrangement so the the line here is just shifted no longer is the line at least as we understand it because this is none of this is is the you know god this is this is just this is reasoning and reasoning is it can change um but the that the fear was from the Marvin Gaye, Robin Thicke thing, and then the dark, the original jury verdict, the fear was that a simple ostinato could be copyrighted, and therefore nobody can ever make music that sounds anything like any other music. That's not true anymore. At least, at least at this stage, and this is not something that's not, not legal advice because it's you know this could get reversed on appeal or something, but at least the way things are right now, the new status quo is that you can confidently make music that could sound a little bit like somebody else's thing as long as the individual elements are not protected because you've used notes and syncopation and beat and whatever. It's if you are more or less outright copying even a small section or if you are if your overall composition, some longer part than an eight note ostinato, and we don't we don't really know what exactly that is yet, but some longer part than an eight note ostinato, that's that could be substantially similar. That could be copyright infringement. Well, we got the real Mambunga who says prediction, judge sentenced to two hundred years plus one day for each hour of the appeal court's time wasted. Carrie Petty and Flame will marry and have five kids. <laughs> <laughs> there you Katie go. Perry? That would be a that would be a solution. That'd be who did Katy Perry just marry? She's marrying uh, Orlando uh, Bloom. Yes, and they're really? having they're having tension. I know well, I, so I mean, they probably got confined into the same house together. <laughs> <laughs> she's pregnant. She's pregnant. She announced she's pregnant, so she's having a baby. Top nice. way. Good news for the good news right in time. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. On that note, people, um, we, can do this. <laughs> we can do this. I would love to do this as often as you guys can, and we'll have time over the next little while. So, like, if, if we're game to do it again, maybe something more controversial next time, like more controversial, more controversial. <laughs> we're on YouTube. What do you want to? What do you expect <laughs> here? Yeah, we, well, I can't even say the word for the thing, the Voldemort that we talked yes. about. Yes. Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh, the uh, the potato trial. We can't talk about potato trial files either, which are. Um, I don't even know which one that is, but don't yeah, tell what me. What are you talking about? Because I like my uh, channel. I like my channel. Limited, Please uh, don't hurt uh, my channel. Martial law and all that good stuff. Yeah, we can talk about martial law. Let's talk about martial law next next time. We, no, hold on. What was Everybody the other? Everybody no, hear the, about the, that. Keem, Keem Star and the tattoo artist, uh, Nico Lacoste. The you okay. Know, the oh. of whatever. That's going to be the next interesting one to follow. Although I don't think it's going to get very far. Guys, you got You you should break it down. Let the world what you think of it. It's an interesting lawsuit to look at. Okay. Um, there are going to be these internment lawsuits coming out too about um, whether people can be um, can be lawfully um, confined. Confined, yeah. Like, like yeah. without a declaration of martial law, you mean? 
Yes, but um, a couple of people were citing the Japanese internment cases. Remember, for national security was one of the. the yeah, but these, these are things out of my uh, league. I don't even. I don't even know. You know, it was funny. It, I don't know if it's funny, but uh, Korematsu, well, the Supreme Korematsu. Court, like, was it last term or the term before? They put essentially like it was co- arguably dicta, but they put in a decision nothing to do with anything that Korematsu was overruled. It's like I bet it's they not. wish they hadn't written that now. It's like, but, <laughs> it's like yeah, but well, put what, that what, now. It's like okay. Yeah, because that that was the, the the for in that case that was the only reason why well the Supreme Court during World War II they ruled that the Japanese internments were law, law, lawful even under strict scrutiny because national security was just just that high a level so yeah you know, even 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 to so so now you have the equal protection issue of interning people based on national origin but national security was so important that you could actually do it. So they, I think they'd yeah. rather that not be the law, but that is the law. So, and, Dar- and Darko Men Forty Two says Lido vid- Lido did a video on it. Hey, we can we can we've got room for one more square in it. We can have you, Jared. You, you right can have middle. six. I think I saw six yeah, was six. the limit when I logged into Streamyard. So we could get uh, Lado and uh, Legal Eagle could try to. Co- I don't know. Does Legal Eagle even do live streams? I don't even. I know. have never seen Legal exactly. Eagle do a live stream, but I mean, I, well, <laughs> I I, like I, it, that would be I mean, Bambuga. I'm not even saying it, but yes, uh, Bam- that, he's trying to get um, you. I would. Uh, I, Legal Eagle would be amazing, man. It would have been fun to do a stream on with Legal Eagle on the impeachment thing because, like, that's at least funny politics and not like you know life altering. Uh, <laughs> oh events. my god. But uh, one one day, one day we'll get like the whole. It'll it'll literally be nine lawyers, and we'll have to like have a moderator, and it'll be good. We can do it. But this is good. I like this. We have a we have a, This is a good game. Well, let's so all we, save up our travel budgets, and we can do a town hall when we're not quarantined. Well, we, my we, we, to next right over here to the living room. So that's that's my travel budget. Well, yeah. no, no, we're all going to be saving on travel. Oh budgets. yes, and lockpicking lawyer. <laughs> Can't forget lockpicking lawyer. Uh, lockpicking lawyer. That's the good. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, he can help us get out of our internment. He'll know how to. Pick well, that's all I have for you today. Lockpick, lockpicking lawyer. Wherever you are, we need you. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah so could you could you please make longer videos? <laughs> we I, like I your voice. I have to start watching lockpicking video. I, I've seen like one or two, but I, I've not. You've, not you've got fifteen hundred to go through if you want. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is everyone stay here. I'm going to end the broadcast. We're going to chat a little bit and 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 you know wind up and talk to each other. But uh, let right. us say that was fun. Good evening. That was fun. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll do it sooner than later. Leonard French. Leonard French right here. Check him out. We got Uncivil Law right there. We got Nate Brody right down there. We got me right here. Oh, gosh, I just picked my nose. Okay. Um, <laughs> now wash your hands. Everyone, thank, you. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll, uh, we'll do it again sooner than later. Be well and, you know, be strong. Okay. Talking soon. Putting the thumb over this piece out I, I only blocked one i only blocked one who did i block here <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i block anybody <laughs> uh not now okay guys that was good that was good man that's a, that was that's a lot of fun that decision 